The following broadcast is a presentation of Mount Zion Media Ministry. from the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, and I shall be reading from the New International Version this morning. Amen. Beginning at verse 2, and I'll read through verse 9. Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jeshub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the laundrious field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm. And don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah. Let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tebiel king over it. Yet, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Amen. The reading of the word. And the subject of the sermon today is simply this. Listen at me. God's desire is to help you make it through your test. But he needs your help. Amen. And we created a third congregation since uh, we talked. I had, we've got the virtual, we've got the in-person in here. Um, but thank God that we have monitors around the outside at perimeter of the church. And so we set up some chairs. And there are people now sitting outside in the, in the hallways looking at the monitors. And so to you out there, I'm saying I need your amens too. I might not hear them, but I can feel them. Amen. I just want to uh, open up by simply stating to every person in here, not to be fooled by anybody or anything that suggests to you that your status as a believer exempt you from life tests. That all of us are candidates for life's test. And when I say test, I'm talking about those things that come up against us and they may originate from us or from outside of us, but they end up testing who we are, what we are made of, what we believe. And the test will come in all shapes, sizes, in all forms. But know that test will be a part of your life. Secondly, I want you to know that tests are not designed to destroy you. And that God does not send them to hurt you. If God sends a test, it is to help you. 
But, but please also know that every test that come, comes your way is not from God. And in this simple passage, this story out of Isaiah, we see God's people being tested. And in this testing experience, there are some things that you and I can learn. And I'm trying to be brief today, and so I need you to buckle up your attention and come ride with me as we go through this. There are lessons for us to learn from them that can help us. And here is what I know, that you ought not check out on me now with your attention because testing, if it's not what you're going through right now, I promise you, it's around the corner. And so if you don't need it now, you better wake up and get it because if not today, tomorrow, or the next day, you're going to need some help. What we see in this text is Judah's test. In verse 3, the test comes, and it comes, uh, verse 2 rather, um, we are told of their test. It comes in a threat from the king and the people of Ephraim. And Ephraim is Israel, the ten tribes of Israel, kinfolk to Judah. And then um, Aram is Syria. And so neither Syria nor Aram, neither Syria nor Israel or Samaria think that they can defeat Israel, or Judah, I mean, by themselves. And Judah is the southern kingdom and all these kingdoms. And, and so neither one think they can beat Judah by themselves, which is led by Ahaz. And so they form a confederacy. They come together and they combine armies of Aram, Assyria, Ephraim, Israel is too powerful for Judah. And Ahaz and the people of Judah get word that this threat is being posed against them because of this confederacy and they are coming to invade them. And you got to listen deeply and you got to think deeply to understand what this threat represents. Ahaz and the people have conceded in their minds that there's no way they can win. They've already been defeated in their own minds and once you're defeated in your own mind, you might as well give up. And what's at stake? It's not just losing a war, but it's losing a way of life. Because once they are defeated, their people will be deported Families will be broken up and they'll be scattered everywhere. And once that happens, their way of life is gone. Their religion is gone. Their families are broken up. Their family life is gone. Things that they've worked to create, wealth, land, houses, a future for their children, it's all gone. Somebody will take that land and won't pay them a dime. Somebody else will live in those, those homes and never pay rent, never pay you for it. The schools that you built, the, 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 the system of life socially you built, it's gone. And so this threat is real. It's real. More than just a war, but life as they know it. And of course, some people will lose their life in war. And can you imagine asking a soldier to go into a war that you've already conceded that you can't win? And your life is just a sacrifice for nothing. And that's their threat. And then what you see uh, in verse 2 as well is their response to the threat. And I want you to uh, look at that and read it because that, there is a picture being painted that you need to see. It says that uh, in, in verse 2 that Ahaz and his people were shaken as trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. Can you see that picture? There's no stability. Fear, represented by the wind, is just tossing them to and fro. There is no restless night in the bed. They're just shaken. There is no stability, no peace, even in your awakened hours, because all you're thinking about is these two countries coming in to invade you. When you look at your children, you tremble in fear because you know in just a little while 
that child may be taken from you. You look at your wife, the love of your life. You look at your husband, the love of your life, and you know that tomorrow, if they decide, one of those soldiers will get her and will be sleeping with her before the night is over. And you look at your husband and you know that he will be stripped down to nothing but a slave. And what can you do? In their mind, their response is nothing. And so they are shaken. There's no stability in their life at all. The threat, the test took it all. I wonder, I wonder before I go any further, is there anybody here ever had a test that shook you, that left you shaken? Like the wind and trees, you were just blowing. One minute you're ready, the next minute you're not ready. One minute you got hope, the next minute the hope is gone. You, you, this is my decision, but no, I don't know if that's the decision. Now. You bring it and you lay it at the altar on Sunday, but by Sunday evening you picked it up again. Yeah, and so, and so there's this threat that represents their test, and there's their response. They're shaking. But then God steps in. Put your hands together and say, God steps in. And why does God step in? Because the God that we serve, he sees our test. God saw what was happening to them. They didn't have to pray and ask God for an answer. They didn't have to turn to God saw it. And based on what God saw, God responded. And this is what I want to tell you today. If you don't hear anything else, God sees your test. Because one of the strategies of the enemy is to convince you that one, God does not see, and two, the reason he does not see is because he does not care. Because after all, you know, he's an all-seeing God and God knows everything. Well, if he knew everything, why doesn't he know what's going on with me? And surely if he knew what was going on with me, he wouldn't let this happen to me. But let me tell you something. Remember, you're not exempt. You don't do so well in the class of life that you get exempt from certain tests. You will not graduate out of here without taking every test that's on the schedule for you. God sees. God sees. It's, it's almost like it's almost like if you've got a small child who's afraid of water and don't want to swim, they won't get in the water. But as soon as you get in the water with them, they're willing to get in there and paddle around because they know you got them. Hold me. And the fear of water disappears because you know he got you. Grandmama got you. Daddy, mom. And, and it's the same way. When, when you know God sees you, it ought to bring about a change. And so what, what happens? God responds. Beginning in verse number three, God responds with a revelation. Say revelation. And a revelation is when God uncovers something and reveals it to you. And I need you to listen at this revelation. What are, what are, what, what are we to do, God? What's going on? The Lord said to Isaiah, you go out there, you and your son, you told him where to go and you find him. And then verse 4, this is what I, want, what I want you to tell him. Be careful. Ahaz, you and the people of Israel, be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. Keep calm. Give attention to maintaining your cool. Don't deny, God, God never said the reality of what was going on was not there, but what I need you to do is be calm. I don't need you to lose heart. I don't need, need you to lose your courage. Because listen, when you become afraid, when you lose heart, when you panic, you start making bad decisions. 
And now is a time that I need you to exercise wisdom and not be making decisions that's going to hurt you. And the backstory to this, when you read from a historical point of view, one of the things that Ahaz and the people were considering was aligning themselves with another country called Assyria to see if they could form a stronger union to defeat. And God is saying, don't you lean on a human being. Don't you let your fear, don't you let your lack of courage cause you to go lean on Assyria. Who you going to lean on? Who you, who, who? Who are you going to lean on? And so he said, don't, don't you do that. God, how you know I was planning to do that? Because I know everything. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Don't, don't you do that. See, he says, in essence, when you look at them, you see two strong kings because, but what I see is two smoldering stubs of firewood. What I see, for those of you that remember this, where there was a fire in the fireplace or some, out, some outside the fire you were burning, when you first put those logs on there, they're burning bright and strong. But God said, that's not what they are. They are logs who burn out and just a little left. And all you got is a little spark, a little flame, but nothing to them. Nothing to them. You've made them big in your own mind. I wonder if there's anybody here who's exaggerated your test and made it bigger than it is. You made it a forest fire when it's really smoldering embers. When you wake up in the morning, be gone. He says, this, that because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remelah, this is getting ready to get good. He says, I know that Aram, Ephraim, and Remelah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, this is their plan. Let's invade Judah. Let's, let's, let's tear up the country and divide it among ourselves upon us a king. God says, let me give you this revelation. I know what they're up to. You heard they were coming. And you just got part of the story, but I know the whole story. And then verse 7, but it won't take place. It won't happen. God had already predetermined that the plot by these two nations would never happen. Yet Ahaz and the people are shaken and worrying themselves to death about what they think will happen while God has already determined that what they are thinking will never happen. And I wonder how many of us are staying up late at night, losing our hair, losing our sleep, our nerves tore up, blood pressure up, everything in our body and mind out of order, worrying about something that God has already made a decision about. Yeah, God already knows the end. And he said, chill, just chill out. Don't be, don't be all frantic, don't, don't panic, don't, don't be making decisions. You, you, don't, you, don't, you, you don't know what I'm up to. So he says it, it won't happen. Then he goes on a little further. So let me, let me just go ahead and, and expand this revelation and tell you something about these folk you are worried about. <clears throat> Again, verse seven, he said, it won't take place, it won't come to pass, but the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. What he's saying is, right now, Damascus uh, is the capital city of Aram, and that's all that's ever going to happen. They will not overtake Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will not be a part of their kingdom. Rezin is their king in Damascus. And that's the only place he gonna reign. I'm not gonna let him reign in Jerusalem. And you are worried about Ephraim? Let me tell you what's going to happen to them. He says within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. And in six, exactly 65 years from this prophecy, Ephraim, the, the nation of Israel, 
they were invaded, broken up, and scattered, and they were not a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria. The head of Samaria is on the rim of the lost sun. Again, Ephraim already has a capital in Samaria. That's the only capital they'll have. Jerusalem, Judah will not be added to it as their plan is. And Remelah will only be king in Samaria, and that's only for a season. And so the idea that you got to worry and that they're going to come and they're going to take over, forget that. I've already settled the matter. And you all tore up over nothing. Listen, listen. Now here is, here it is. Here's, here's all this build up. The people have to respond to the revelation. And your response to the revelation is more important than your response to the problem or the test. The test is one thing, but the revelation is another. Because the God who gives the revelation is bigger than the test. And you've heard it over and over. It doesn't matter what happened to you. What matters is how you respond to it. It's your attitude. And, and when your response is based on revelation from God, that's mean that it's, it's based on truth and you can meet that, that test with a, with, let me just say that I almost let it out the back. You can read, meet it with the right attitude. Yeah. The same situation, people will handle it differently based on the attitude. And, and the reason the revelation is so important, you, you don't want to be responding to a situation based out of ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. You got to make sure that it's true revelation. You know, and let me just give you an, an, an extreme e example. Uh, somebody said to me one time, you ain't no real prophet. I said, why you say that? Because the Bible said it, they can pick up serpents and snakes and they won't bite them. You, you picked up any snakes? I said, tell you what, you take that revelation and you go pick them up and come back and tell me how it is. But, but, but God hadn't told me that. And there are a lot of folk going around standing on stuff that God hadn't said. Making decisions based on foolishness and you got revelation from somebody else. Who, who gives you your revelation? And can, I, can, can I tell you something that's real dangerous that I see? Um, the, the, you know, the church has me on a Facebook page. I, don't, you know, I go out there. We post stuff, and I see all this stuff people be saying and telling people to do it. And like, is that, is that who you get your revelation from? Like this morning when I went on to read our, our, um, Mount Zion's devotion, there was one on there where somebody had some $100 bills in, up on the, some bushes and talking about if you share this, you'll never be broke. I said, what the fuck? But here it is. I checked how many times it had been shared. And folk bought that foolishness. Yeah. Send this out and love will come back to you. Where, where you get your revelation from? Yeah. Where, 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 where do you get your revelation? And so, and so, they have to respond to the revelation. And here it is. God says, I got this. And you, you hear me good now. What I plan to do to Aram and Ephraim, I'm going to do. No matter what you do, I already got my plans for them. But here is what I need you to do. I want, it's my desire to help you make it through this test. But I need your help. I'm going to do my part, but there's a part that you got to do. And my part is designed to help you make it through. And your part is designed to help you make it through. Forget the notion that I'm going to do it all for you. I need you to do something for yourself. And I'm so glad he didn't say, I need you to get the soldiers together and I need you to go fight them. He didn't say, I need you to um, get... Uh, some money and go pay him off. I need you to go and negotiate this with Assyria. I need you. He didn't ask him to do any of those things that's above him. 
But look at verse 7 again. He says, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. And so God says, here is where I need your help. I need you to stand firm in your faith. Faith in the revelation that I just gave you. Because if you don't stand in faith, you won't stand at all. You ought to wake up and write that down. The way you stand in the test is to stand in faith or you won't stand at all. You don't stand in your own strength. You don't stand in your own rationalization. Well, let me read this and examine this and see what I come up with. And after examining this and going through it and my deductive reasoning and logic, and I'll come to this conclusion. You stand in your faith, not your conclusion. And not that revelation you get from somewhere. I don't know where. And so question is, where is your faith? Who, who is your faith in? What is your faith in? It ought to be in God and in his revelation. In the case you said, well, I had never got a revelation. This is revelation from Genesis to revelation. What, what does God say in his word? That's, that's the first place of, of, of revelation. And then when you're in relationship with him, God will speak to you and reveal things to you about your current situation. And this is not a, a, a commercial, but this is just the truth. Uh, when, when, uh, when they first came out with the vaccine, y'all heard me say adamantly, I wasn't going to take it. And, and I was going to do everything I could, could to keep anybody connected to me from taking it. But laying on my bed one day, I got a revelation. I had looked at the information, and I still didn't take it. And then I got the revelation, and then I had some consults with some people that I trusted uh, to help me navigate the revelation that I got. God will speak to you. God will reveal things to you about what it is you ought to be doing. And then the question is, can you stand firm in your faith? No matter what's going on around you, no matter what other people are doing, if God said it, can you stand firm in it? Because God said, if you don't stand in your faith, you're not going to be able to stand. You are blowing like a, like a leaf in the wind, like a tree blown by the wind. You're going to still be blowing. And the only thing that can keep you stable is your faith. You lost heart. You're scared. You don't have any courage. The only thing that can keep you moving, keep you from making bad decisions, keep you, from, keep you walking in wisdom is your faith. Because listen, there still might be a lack of courage, but faith lets you step forward. Even where there's still a little faint-heartedness. Say this to saints, and then I got three quick things to tell y'all about it. Are you one of those saints that I talked about the other Sunday who are hearers but not doers? We got a lot of folks shout all in the church about what the Lord don't do, what the Lord will do. Oh, he this and he that. But when it comes to life, thanks for watching. Be blessed and continue walking in the light.